We might as well get started. I, I was expecting this room to be full to brimming, but it just hasn't happened. So we're just going to get rolling, and uh, hopefully we can, um, I don't know, some of you guys in the back, come on up. Just let's get cozy. Um, so today's, this is a session, if you don't know where you are you, and you can't read, it is AI-driven image captioning for inclusive productivity. So what we're talking about today is captioning. Um, and what we have today is uh, four fantastic scholars to talk a little bit about the state of the art in the space, uh, and uh, me to hopefully just coordinate a little bit. Um, so right now, PowerPoint has some pretty amazing things that just come out of the box. Uh, you can, this is a picture of my uh, kitten, and because the internet is really good with cats, it actually does a pretty good job of identifying it correctly. Um, it's a cat lying on the ground. And if you go into uh, PowerPoint these days, for any image and you look at alt text, it will automatically generate alt text for your um, images. But sometimes it's better than others. So this is uh, an example from a, um, a study we did a couple of years ago, and for some reason the text is giant on this. But this was a tweet that was associated with Hillary Clinton back when she was running for president. And it said, some on the other side may say our best days are behind us, let's prove them wrong. And so when we ran this in, in our little study and we did um, sent this up to um, the image captioning, this was the uh, caption it gave us. I'm not really confident, but I think it's a man doing a trick on a skateboard at night. <laughs> now, okay, so it's easy to kind of laugh about that, and, and, but you can imagine that that also is something that people will just discount immediately because it's ridiculous that you know this is a, this is a um, the tweet is associated with let's prove them wrong and it's Hillary Rodham Clinton, so this seems kind of crazy. But yet, when we talked to participants, this is one of our participants, she said, well, if you say there's an older man on a skateboard at night, that would make more sense. That's the way I take our best days are behind us, because I'm an old lady. So basically, this is a, a blind woman who is making sense of this caption that was provided with this um, tweet, basically just because she needs to try to understand what it might possibly be. So this is an interesting thing for us. Um, this also points a little bit to the challenges that we're involved in here, right? That, that not only do you have to be right, but you need to provide people with at least a sense of, I mean, we say I'm not confident in the, in the caption, but people still believe it. So there's another problem, which is how do you do captioning for something like this? The auto description by PowerPoint, this is a really famous, um, uh, information um, uh, info viz thing from um, a map showing Napoleon's Russian campaign. And it's showing all kinds of things at once. So how can you imagine providing a caption for something like that? Or even just a simple line graph for that matter that's usable. The, the auto description on this is close up image of a map. There's some other ways you can go about this. And this is some work that we've done in our group so the alt text on this image um, is this ridiculous thing here, this h3fs0x yada 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 dot jpeg. Now, we had an idea that there are other captions out in the world that we can suck in and explore for this. And so this was some work that we did where if you go out onto the web and you do image search and you match those images, there are a lot of images that appear other places that are well captioned. So using something like our um, caption crawler technology, we can show that it's an Antarctic volcano, Mount Erebus, seen over NASA. This is actually a pretty good caption. I mean, so we get that from elsewhere. But this is not, this is sort of semi-automated in a way. So what we're gonna think about today are some of that, what I think of as some of the big problems, and, and I think these are shared by most of our panelists. If not, then that's even better, um, is, how are people who are blind or low vision engaging with the digital images today? Like, what are they actually doing? And what do they want to do with this content? And what kinds of algorithmic and interactive approaches are gonna actually get us to let them be able to do those things? And what do we need to do to train our models? What kind of data do we need in order to get there? And finally, how do we know if we get there? 
What, what, what kind of metrics do we actually need in order to understand this? So I think these are a lot of really big, deep problems in the state of the art within image captioning that hopefully we can start to talk a little bit about today. So in order to do that, we have four amazing scholars. Um, and we will start with, I'm going to move back to our thing so you can see the order. It's there. So we're going to start with uh, Donna Garari. Um, she's at the University of Texas. Um, she's actually been associate, collaborating with us a little bit on some recent work. And she'll hopefully talk a little bit about that. Um, Kathleen McCoy from University of Delaware. Uh, Walter Lasecki, uh, University of Michigan. And then we'll wrap up with Aja Kumar here at MSRAI. And then, God willing, we will um, have lots of time for questions after that to really start to engage with all you guys. So with that, I will shut up and turn this over to Donna. Are you plugging in or are you? I'm plugging in. OK. Splendid. All right, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Donna Garari, and I'm going to share about our team's work on describing images taken by people who are blind. There you go. So describing images such as this one with a caption such as, two t-shirts, one white, the other black, hanging in a closet, or answering visual questions such as which shirt is black, answer is on the right, uh, may seem trivial to many of you, but for people who are blind, such tasks um, are obstacles that can significantly impede them in their daily lives. There's an estimated 39 million, peop million people worldwide who are blind. Of note, many people go blind later in life, uh, so each of you may be concerned, both for yourselves and people you know. Um, in fact, 82% of all people who are blind are 50 years and older. So nearly 10 years ago, a mobile phone application called VizWiz was released to help people who are blind get descriptions of their images. With this application, a user could double click on the phone to take an image, then double click on the phone to record a question about the image, and then have those both sent to a team of people who in turn would either provide a caption or an answer. Since that application emerged, it inspired a number of other applications to emerge to do a similar thing of returning a caption or providing an answer to a visual question. And the commonality is that there is a reliance on, rem on uh, remote humans to provide answers. Um, of note, this idea has also been done using glasses where there's a camera sitting on the glasses as well. The limitation is that these applications rely on humans, which means they can be more costly, they can be slower response times, and they also lead to privacy issues. So the aim of our group is to teach computers to automatically describe any image, and I emphasize including from real users, i.e. people who are blind. So in this talk, I will talk about two of the contributions that have come to our, from our research group. The first is an infrastructure for empowering the AI community to create algorithms that assist real users of visual assistance technology. And the second is to discuss some new difficult AI challenges that were inspired by real users' data. So diving into the first topic. Just some background. I think we have an interdisciplinary group, so I just want to talk about how do we nowadays teach computers to do a task? So the typical approach is to train using as many labeled examples as possible. So think about how you would teach, for example, a child to recognize a person. The intuition of how we teach is we might show an example of an image with a person and say this is a person. But we would probably show many examples so that a child learns that there are people of different colors, shapes, sizes, configurations, and so on. This is the same situation we have when we teach a black box which I show here to represent any kind of algorithm. Okay? So with algorithms, the goal is also to provide as many training examples as possible. So an exciting aspect of what I've been talking about is that the AI community has already been trying to teach computers to describe images. 
uh, for image captioning. This started back in 2006 with the first publicly available data set, had 20,000 examples of, in it. And over time, the size of that data set has grown to be hundreds of thousands of examples. This is also true for the visual question answering task, where the first public data set emerged in 2014 and has grown all the way up to over a million examples in recent years. The problem with existing data sets, though, is that they are a mismatch from what is going on with real users today. So if you look at the way existing data sets have been created, the pictures and questions come from different people or automatically generated. Um, typically, these questions are scraped from online, uh, from photo sharing websites such as Flickr. So lots of them are high quality images. They're also typically scraped along a certain theme, like does it contain a dog, a person, and so on. The questions are also contrived. Uh, again, they come from someone else. Typically, this is a hired crowd worker to make up an interesting question or from an algorithm that makes up an interesting question. In reality, when we look at the, a real use case of, these, of the desire for these services, um, the same person is both taking the picture and asking the question. And moreover, the data is reflecting real users' interests. So our approach for creating an infrastructure to empower the AI community in creating algorithms to describe images taken by real users is twofold. First is we created the infrastructure, which is a big label data set. Second is we figured out how to scale in order to involve a larger community so we can accelerate progress on this important problem. So for the first task of creating the big label data set, again, um, we took advantage of that VizWiz mobile phone application I described at the start. Uh, it was used between 2011 and 2015. Uh, over 11,000 people submitted over 70,000 requests to that application. Um, we, in uh, recent years, grabbed about four, almost 45,000 of those where users agreed to share their data to support research. And of note, about 15% of those images that are included in that data set were requests for just captions, not answers to visual questions. Um, this is data from real users, so it's very important to protect their privacy and anonymity. So the first step we did is we transcribed the questions to remove people's voices. We also resaved any Im all the images to remove any metadata such as GPS location indicating where a person's at. We then had in-house people filter all the images for any personally identifying information. Finally, we did data labeling in order to collect high quality captions and answers that could be used to support our AI challenge. In total, our data sets are, we have two data sets that um, we are publicly releasing. The first one has over 30,000 image question pairs with over 300,000 crowdsource answers. The second one has over 39,000 images with almost 200,000 captions of them. And so this is the first data set where real users requested image captions as well as answers to their visual questions to support their real daily needs. Um, if we look at how hard is this data set for existing state-of-art algorithms. We find that existing algorithms perform poorly on this data set. I show here some examples for visual question answering and for captioning. And in general, we want to see scores close to one, and we are far from that. So this is a difficult challenge for the AI community as of when we uh, release the data sets. And this is just an example to show where these algorithms fall short. You have an image here where the captioning system says, a man is holding his head on a cell phone. Okay. So that's inspiration for an AI community. They want hard problems. We created a hard problem coming from real users' data. So the next thing was how to scale. First step is we shared our data set. It is publicly available. You today can go to viswiz.org and find it. And so currently, the visual question answering data set is out. We will be releasing the image captioning data set soon, along with some other labeled data sets. Of note, uh, others are also sharing the data set. Since we released it, it was ingested into academic torrents, Kaggle, and recently Facebook's platform to encourage the design of multimodal algorithm design. To track progress, we also provided a public evaluation server with Leaderboard where people who are competing to try to do well on our tasks uh, can see where's their rank amongst 
people internationally who are competing. We also organized an event to foster a community and celebrate progress back in uh, 2018 in Germany, and we plan to continue to do so. Um, and this, is, uh, this brought together researchers both from industry and um, practitioners, in, in, uh, sorry, practitioners in industry and researchers from academia to speak about the space. Um, and this progress has been celebrated around the world. Uh, people are blogging about it, and we've had articles coming out all the way out in South Korea, um, in Europe, and we have others celebrating on, multi, on uh, public media about the successes of progress on this important problem. So to summarize, we created a big data, we figured out how to scale, the community is still actively working on this problem, um, but the problem's not yet solved. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes this problem hard. So to dive into the next contribution of our group, I'll talk about new difficult AI challenges that are inspired by real users' data. So to recap, uh, we began with almost 45,000 requests from users where they agreed to share their data. And of course, we, we went through anonymizing the data, filtering out private information, um, and labeling all the data. So one of the key challenges we found is that the images are inadequate quality. This isn't quite surprising. People who are blind can't necessarily verify the quality of the images they're taken. So uh, we found that 9% of over 39,000 images have quality issues that are so severe that you can't recognize the content and describe it. We found that 29% of over 30,000 visual questions aren't answerable. For example, what is the expiration date? It's not shown in the image. Similarly, what is this a gift card for? What temperature is the dial set to? So important AI challenges include guiding users to take high quality images and also to help them capture the content of interest in their images. Another important challenge that emerged is how to deal with private content. We found that 12% of, of almost the 45,000 images are showing private content. Content includes things like faces, credit cards, pregnancy tests, computer screens, prescription pills, and many more described in the publication at the bottom of the screen. And of these privacy disclosures, 16% of those examples were intentional. Questions such as, what is the medicine in this pill bottle, were included. Moreover, one out of every 40 visual questions that were asked with the app um, we're asking about private information such as pregnancy tests, pill bottles, letters, and street signs. So another AI challenge is how do we create big data of private content to teach algorithms? And also, how do we develop algorithms that can analyze private content? And the third key challenge that we observed is that there's a diversity of practical interests. So here I show a distribution of all the questions that were asked in the publicly available visual question data set. Key questions that emerge are, what is this? What is in this can? What does this say? And what color is this? Uh, zooming in from that, we found that 53% of the questions involve reading text. So things like, could you please tell me what's in the can? What are the directions for someone who's 10 years old? Do I have to hit anything, any key combination to make it work? Where the last example is someone installing Microsoft on their computer. We also found that 28% of the questions involve recognizing color, such as, is this shirt clean or dirty? What color is my shirt? Does the pant in this shirt match, and can it be worn together? So another AI challenge is describing images by analyzing text and recognizing color. So to summarize some of the new difficult AI challenges that we uh, observed from the data, we see that systems need to deal with inadequate images, private content, and text and color analysis. So to summarize, real users of visual assistance technology are sharing their data to help the research community make progress on problems that matter to them in their daily lives. We took their data and packaged it into a challenge that's available for the AI community to work on real use cases, and progress is being made today. Moreover, 
Uh, the data set is highlighting new important problems, such as dealing with inadequate images, private content, and text analysis. There are many people to acknowledge. Some of you are in the room. Uh, there's the team that built these data sets. There's also the team that built the application for the VizWiz system, help in crowdsourcing design, help in developing our evaluation server. There's all the people who use the VizWiz application. There's the over 1,600 crowd workers who helped to label our data and others in the room. So what are some next steps? Um, everything we're doing is with the hope to inspire our community and we are publicly sharing all the data. This is a visualization of a tool we built for everyone in the room to use to browse the data set. You can see that we're browsing through a bunch of visual questions with the captions. And moreover, you can search on words that are in the visual question, words that are in the caption, words that are in the answers, and more. So you can get a glimpse of the data set. We also invite you to advance the design of AI algorithms. We currently have two challenges that are available for the community, and we have more coming soon. So thank you very much for your time. Yes, thank you for great work. It's certainly very interesting. I'm especially interested in the mention of the privacy. Uh, you said you have created a new version of data set with uh, privacy content and intentional and unintentional privacy classification, but that's not, uh, it's not entirely clear to me how you're gonna take advantage of the privacy information. Are you trying to persuade those blind users not to upload those privacy images? Or it's like, uh, like any kind of a suggestion or visual assistance regarding when regarding the privacy sharing, how are you going to use the privacy annotations? Do I need to take it now or later? Go ahead and take it now. <laughs> um, so, privacy is so important, right? We're seeing over one out of ten of the uh, privacy disclosures. Twelve percent of the images have privacy information. So we must, as a community, deal with this to make people feel safe and trusting of the technology. So now the question is, how do we make progress without requiring people to share their information? So one of the key findings of the work we did, and there's a lot more of a discussion, is we showed that you actually don't need private information to make an algorithm that can detect automatically private content and image. What we did with the data set we publicly released is we actually removed the regions of private information from every image and only preserve the context. We tried using different in-painting algorithms and that's an expertise we have in-house in our team is designing algorithms to try to generate fake content and images. Um, and we found that using these images where we wipe out only the private regions and put in some fake content is useful for training algorithms to recognize private information in other in novel new images. Yeah, I agree, and uh, I think it makes sense if you just wanted to de 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 detect the occurrence of the privacy regions in the images, then context information will do, and the generating models will help. I, I can uh, that all those make sense to me. But my confusion is, so now you have a model that can detect the privacy attribute, uh, like existing or not in an uploaded image. Are you gonna, how are you gonna? take advantage of yet when you use that trend model, are you trying to persuade the users not to upload an image when the image is taken with privacy or what? what? So, yeah. Okay, so there's the, what I think is the immediate solutions and then there's the long-term dream. The immediate is um, in the work that we show, we, we put out there the idea of just recognizing does an image have private information or not? If the answer is yes, you probably wanna notify the user about that because often it's unintentional, right? So that's the first user experience task we can do. The second user experience task you can imagine is we have an image and a question about the image. So the next step is to detect whether the person intended to share that private information. And if we say, and we showed some algorithms, we showed promising uh, results that show yes, algorithms can understand the intent from the question in the image. And in that case, then you can think about having those visual questions sent out to a secure, more expensive, trusted crowd, right? So you can imagine creating tiers. Or a local server even, without sending them out. Exactly. All right. um, but then the dream, of course, that I have is that we start to figure out how to automatically generate fake-looking images 
so we can start to figure out how to design algorithms to just not have humans in the loop, be able to design algorithms to handle that private information entirely. And I think the step for that is creating fake images, and that's something that the computer vision community is making great progress on, and I think it's viable in the future. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody hear me okay. So I am Kathy McCoy, I'm Professor and Chair of Computer Science at the University of Delaware, where I have specialized in the area of natural language generation and also accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, I'm also a technical consultant for Nidler National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research which is part of the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services. The reason why that's relevant is because I dabble a little bit in sort of policy types of um, issues that are involved with the government. Um, for a good number of years, um, I have been looking at trying to um, create a textual summary of an information graphic. An information graphic is something like a, a bar chart or a line graph. And what I'm showing up on the screen are a couple of multimodal documents that you might uh, pick up on the web, and you can see in the screen, on, on the screen that there are some line graphs in there. Now, the interesting thing in studying these line graphs, um, or, or, well, these kinds of information graphics that occur in articles that we see those graphics may or may not even be talked about in the article. And certainly the main reason why they are there, they're there for a communicative intent that the author has and wants you to get out of it. If we don't do something to allow uh, people who are blind or visually impaired to have access to them, they're losing out on that information. And so I, I wanted to, to find out, well, what, what could we do? Typically, accessibility for uh, uh, people who are blind or visually impaired, they use screen readers, um, and screen readers uh, can easily provide text um, that you have in a document, has no clue what to do with an image for the most part, and we, we, we've already heard uh, some of the things we can do. Alt text is, you know, you're, it's supposed to be there, it's often missing, or it's completely misleading. And one question that I've had is, what should this alt text contain anyway for these kinds of graphics? The law, uh, the, uh, uh, or you know, federal guidelines say, well, just, you know, if you have a, a graph of some time, put the data in there. Well, I I'm sorry, that doesn't work, right? Um, the whole reason why there's a picture is because it does something, it tells us something. That's really what we want to capture. And besides, alt text is not at all possible if we've got big data, uh, sorry, the, putting the data in is not at all possible, well, alt text at all, for big data or dynamically generated visualizations. And these things are really important. So what do we do? Well, we had this site project that has been like 15 years in the making. And our hypothesis was in this that what we wanted to do was to put in the alt text what someone who was cited would get out of a casual look, all right, of, of it. And we thought that this was the most important message, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we mean by that, and then also some salient visual features. Let me see. So some uh, important messages. The important message of a graph, particularly a line graph, it has something to do with the data in the graph, but it also has something to do with what the, the author may decorate that graph with, uh, call out boxes and things like that. That, that can alter that. Um, but it, it's basically, what's the trend doing for a line graph? Increasing, decreasing, changing, et cetera. So we thought that that was the um, most important uh, sort of thing to put in a graph. And what I've, I've shown here, for example, um, uh, the, I have a graph up. I'm going to put more graphs up because it'll be easier. Um, the, what we have on the left is a graph that um, the, looks like it is, there's a bit of a stable trend, and then there's a rising trend. 
To be honest, if I look at this graph, I see more of a rising trend. But why do I think that it's actually a stable trend followed by a rise? It's because the author also called something out to us on this graph, this 1.79. It calls out the beginning of the graph and the end of the graph. Not, didn't put something in the middle where it, you know, it was flat and then it goes up. It called out the whole thing. And so that, that I think has something to do with, even though that first part is smaller, why it's probably important. Anyway, hurry, hurry. Um, so there, there's a, another stable and a fall, and then there's a rise and a fall. We think that's the backbone of what ought to be in a graph, in, in a summary, in a, a summary, but there ought to be more. And we tried to get people to give us, you know, write some summaries of graphs of, of what's going on. And a couple of things popped up. So the graph on the left is, is highly volatile. It's really jagged. That kind of thing is usually mentioned if it's there. Um, the annotations tell us something. We've got to recognize that. The second graph is really smooth. You might, re you might say something about that. The third graph is uh, really steep. So things like steepness and, and things like that might occur. This we can all get out of the, the vision component. So um, we actually, and the, the generation person to me was really interested in making nice, beautiful text. I think we did a pretty good job. So here's an example. The image shows a line graph which presents IRS's percentage of returns e-filed. The line graph shows a rising trend from 1996 to 2005. The rising trend has a starting value of 12.6% and an ending value of 51.1%. Beautiful, right? Is it good? Is it useful? Well, that's an important question. Um, so we did evaluate, and the question is, how do we evaluate what's going on here? And again, the way that we want to evaluate it is, can people who are visually impaired get out of it what, what someone who is sighted would get out of it? So we figured, oh, well, what they really ought to do is, can they answer questions about it, the most important things that you get from a graphic? Now, I just have to point out, maybe we can all figure this out ourselves. Um, I can't be the one to make up the questions because I made up the system, right? That's cheating. Uh, so we had to collect some questions and then we also had to make sure that we filtered them because they, they couldn't have domain information, all of that, stuff you could really get from a graph. Anyway, so that in itself is important, but that's the key. Why is it that we're doing this? What is it that we want to be able to get out of it? And I think that's a lot of, of the message that we've already heard. Um, our system did pretty well, if I do say so myself. However, um, it, was, it was really broken in a lot of ways because we didn't really have a vision component that could give us all of the pieces that we needed in order to do this. Um, and uh, my colleague in the room, uh, Ed Kim, over here uh, heard me talk once and he said, hey, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm a vision person. Uh, can't we learn, just learn how to go from the graph to the text? And I said, no, we can't. Um, <laughs> I, it, it, it's too hard, how are, how are we gonna do it? Um, and so we, we had to negotiate some um, we did want to use supervised deep learning. All right, we need lots and lots of training data. We didn't have the training data. Um, we need uh, neural network, uh, all right. So what we decided to do, instead of doing this one-shot deal, what we're doing is a little dance between the vision and the, and the generation. Um, and it also made the, the training data significantly easier to acquire. So we acquired some training data from Mechanical Turk, and rather than having people give us whole summaries, what we tried to do was to get people to give us that, the pieces of information that we needed in order to build the summary. Um, and so things like, uh, so I'm, there's a graph up at the top. This is what uh, one of the, the hit, hits would look like. Um, we asked them things like, what's represented on the x-axis? We have to generate that. What's represented on the y-axis? Um, what's the title? Um, what's the primary trend category? So that they could give us that information and then we could learn those pieces of it. Um, we, uh, there's, 
one thing that I wanted to, to put up with this architect, the only reason I put this up was so that we found out that it's not just the image that's important when we're trying to learn this stuff, but we've got to pull the words out separately and reason on them separately. So we actually have two sort of streams um, going in. Um, I'm showing now a, a, an example of uh, uh, what we have been able to generate to date. Uh, this graph titled uh, cost to sequence a human genome, USD, shows a falling trend in millions over years. The x-axis goes from 2001 to 2017. The y-axis goes from 100 to 100 million. Uh, the end of the graph continues to fall, and the graph shows few fluctuations. So now you may have noticed, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, th there are these A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, in there, those are the pieces that the, the vision system pulled out. And then what we're doing is putting those pieces in, in uh, right now we're putting them together in not such a, it, it's just a template-based generator. Um, I imagine that that template-based generator might get a lot more sophisticated um, you know, as, as we go on in time, all right. Um, Okay, there are some, uh, just some other examples. I, I don't think that's um, super uh, important now. So where are we? Well, we're still e extracting stuff from graphs and we're getting ready for an evaluation of this system um, with the, the, the latest thing to see, and, and we're grappling with how are we gonna set up that uh, evaluation to make sure that we're on the right track and that we're giving something that's really important. Um, I just wanted to finish with a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, um, Yogi Berra, who is an exceptional catcher for the Yankees. Um, and what I've, I've got on the screen is a picture of Yogi Berra and a, a batter who just bunted a foul ball pretty high in the air. And Yogi's got his eye on that ball, he's thrown off his mask, and trust me, he catches it, right? Um, and the favorite quote that I like is, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Um, and that's my, you know, sort of lesson that I think that we've got to think about when we're thinking about problems of accessibility. Um, we've got to figure out where we need to go <laughs> in order to make things accessible. Otherwise, we might not get there. We might have very nice systems but they might not be doing what we need them to do. Um, so I'd like us all to keep our eye on the accessibility ball. Um, uh, so thank you. Reminder, we're going to hopefully have plenty of time for questions at the end. <laughs> them down. All right. Good to go. All right. Um, so I'm Walter Lasecki from the University of Michigan. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, a little bit of why this is hard. So I woke up this morning and I thought to myself, Will I have anything to say after Donna gives an awesome talk? <laughs> and she did give an awesome talk. Um, and, but I, I will have a couple things left to, to try to draw distinctions from, uh, between classes of problems and why some of this is hard. Uh, but I am here to make sure that we get time for the panel at the end, so this will be a little bit quicker. <laughs> um, if you saw my other talk this morning, uh, you have seen the slide before. Um, this is a kind of bit of background on what uh, my lab and I work on. We think a lot about how to scaffold interactive intelligence systems um, in a way that will allow human intelligence to fill in the gaps where automated systems might not be uh, capable of making uh, the entire experience work for a user, and this includes things like accessibility applications, including visual question answering. Um, so we think about trying to get things deployable, robust, and work every time, even if it's not necessarily automated every single time. Uh, so we not only come up with new methods for organizing real-time groups, we also think about how to 
um, fill in in new ways, and even start training these systems in richer ways than uh, we currently have, which means I can teach a rule to the system uh, more efficiently. So we've thought a lot about how to build systems that answer visual questions. Um, uh, so I want to start with just a really simple example. So uh, we talked about image labeling in both of the prior talks. Um, how would you label this image? I'm also here to make sure everybody's still awake. Uh, <laughs> how would you just label this image? If you, if you just needed to give a you know, one or two word caption, this, no, not a full description. Benches in a park, right. So we might have a uh, park, uh, oh, I don't have my preview here. Um, maybe, maybe something that mentions the canon, that seems like a very clear visual um, features, uh, feature. Uh, you might also want some information about uh, information that's not directly contained in the image. So it turns out this is a park in Buffalo. It's a rainy day, it's a rainy day right? Something about the, the weather, right? You, you can't, uh, necessarily see that it is, you know, it's not currently raining, but it's probably a rainy day, right? Um, so even just at the couple of words level, we can want a lot of different information from this image. And it gets even harder uh, if you want to be able to do visual question answering, which is what VizWiz, which was initially designed to do, and, you know, eventually resulted in this very interesting data set um, uh, that we can use to train AI systems. Um, but now I can start to ask things as a user, like, do you see the canon? So maybe that's a, uh, ironically, that covers up the canon, but <laughs> um, do you see the canon? So maybe that's a landmark that I'm looking for. I'm supposed to meet somebody by the canon at noon. Um, or are there open benches? So this is kind of a state of the world thing. If people are sitting uh, in all of the seats, then maybe I know I don't need to uh, walk all the way across the, the path here. I could also ask questions that may not, might not actually make sense in a particular scene. Uh, so text wrapping aside, uh, do you see anywhere to park? So maybe you know your friend's coming to meet you there, they need to, to park somewhere, but there's no parking lot here, that's not a question that I can necessarily uh, answer, right? So it gets messier and messier as we go, and there's a bunch of other information that I might want from this visual scene. So it's not that there's one simple answer that I could learn. You can imagine park is reasonable if I just want a label. It's not true if I have to pair this with uh, natural language information. And the richer the question, the more complicated this gets. Um, maybe you even have tailored information. So do you see my friend? I don't know what your friend looks like. <laughs> even if you say, do you see someone wearing a red shirt? Right now I need to pick that feature based on the, the language that was used. And this is gonna be a relatively rare question. Nobody else is looking for your friend, right? So we're not gonna have a million examples of uh, answers for that at any point. Okay, so the solution that was uh, uh, proposed by uh, Bigham et al. was to use people. And so this works pretty well. In fact, it is how we can get to uh, at scale data sets, answering tens of thousands of questions for real users. Um, so I'm. So I'm going to um, push on that a little bit more. I'm not here to necessarily hit take the person out of it just yet. Uh, I actually wanna make the argument that we need to keep people in these systems for a little bit longer. So crowd worker is usually behind the scenes in this case. Um, but we can do that in real time. So if you imagine uh, a setting like this where I have a store shelf with lots and lots of different items, uh, again, we can get these relatively complicated uh, to answer questions like, Where's the, the hot salsa? So not necessarily, you know, I don't want mild. It's not what I'm here for. <laughs> well, so now I need to find a type of object. I need to locate where it is, and then I need to find information on that object in order to answer this question. And it actually turns out to be um, a sequential task because I might not be able to see that label. I actually don't know where the salsa is on here. Uh, let's see, there. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so now, we have this problem of framing the information. And so the 9% of VizWiz images that don't contain anything useful, in a lot of those cases, what you have is someone who, who didn't quite capture either the right side of the object, they um, blurred information, they misframed the object so that it wasn't actually in the scene well enough to, to capture the right information. Um, so we did some work, uh, assets 13 
that looked at how you could you build an interactive system that in real time could respond to follow-up questions. So now I can uh, take an object, easier to take one object than a shelf, um, and I could say, you know, let's see if I can, uh, how much sodium, okay, this is a terrible example, but it's one I have. <laughs> how much sodium uh, is in this uh, package? So, may frame the information incorrectly, right, the front label is not actually particularly useful in figuring out how much sodium if it wasn't water. Um, so what you want is feedback that says, well, rotate the bottle a little bit, zoom in, okay, now I can give you the answer to your question. So you, you need interaction as a way to access this information that's not immediately available um, uh, from a single image. You actually need to give feedback and guidance to the, the end user themselves. Um, it's the same thing for a lot of fine-grained information that's not immediately accessible, what's serving size, things like that. Okay, this gets even harder when we go to um, sequential interaction settings, or inter interaction settings that are necessarily sequential. So here, I don't have all of the information that I might want. I, as a student, you might go to this web page and say, well, how do I check my admission status? That's actually an information navigation task. I need to be able to click on a good starting point that is not uh, clearly defined from the question itself, and then I need to be able to follow a reasonable set of um, kind of inferred connections to, to navigate through the menus. So this gets really, really messy, and at this point, we're down the, uh, how many times does this get asked? Maybe I can answer the admissions question. Um, but something like how do I sign up for courses might be a rarer question. It's rarer because you don't actually do that from this page. Right, so you need to know that there is no answer here. So there's a lot of subtlety here. A person could do this relatively easily. They could click around a little bit. In fact, that's exactly what they do. Visually, you get a lot of information at a time about where uh, certain functionality might lie, and then you navigate based on that. Um, so uh, Steve Oney and others, uh, including myself, built this system for uh, WIS 2018 that actually allows you to call on a remote helper, so a crowd worker, recruited on demand from the web, and help uh, complete a navigation task or identify that this is not something that can be done uh, from the current page. So you can go, you can in real time go get a uh, bit of human feedback exactly when we don't know, and then we can use that to automate the system. So this helps us handle the long tail problem where there's gonna be a lot of rare queries that we haven't necessarily heard. The more complex the interaction, the more complex the setting, the, the thinner and thinner our data set gets for a large percentage of questions. Um, and this is kind of two of the hardest problems that we know about at the same time, right? It's not just that we have to understand complex visual scenes, but that context changes based on the natural language query, the use case that we have in each uh, setting. So the hope is that kind of going back to this idea of scaffolding, we have an automated system that wants to answer a question. It's missing some piece of information. It doesn't understand uh, either if it has the right answer or, or which part of the scene is supposed to be relevant to, um, to answering the query. Uh, so you can actually, in real time, call on uh, human assistance, get a response, and eventually what we want is that the, the people giving this response are able to convey as much as possible about their model of the world, how they understand both the question that was asked and the visual scene and how it might contain uh, answers to that question. And then the hope is that by doing this repeatedly, now we can deploy systems that learn in the wild and uh, don't fail for users uh, even the first time the system experiences a given class of questions. All right, so the kind of the takeaway there is visual question answering is hard, um, but I think we can get uh, farther with human back systems. And actually, you know, the downstream effect of that is exactly what Donna talked about earlier, where you can even get these data sets that uh, turn into challenge problems for the AI community. So, thanks. Okay, this is the right one. Um, hi everybody, I'm the last one. Nobody wanted to be the last one, so here I am. <laughs> I'm giving the last talk. My name is Ajay Kumar. I'm a researcher in MSRAI. And today, after hearing these talks that are very focused on image captioning, I'm gonna try to go one level up and talk about 
what do we mean by AI systems function in the world? How can we build reliable AI systems? And I'm gonna try to use image captioning as a case study to convey some of the high level messages I've been thinking about. So every AI talk starts with a slide like this. We basically celebrate a lot of the advances we had in deep neural networks, image, multimodal, language tasks, and we compare the machine performance to the human performance and say that AI is doing great. And from these results, we started seeing a lot of AI technologies being applied in many real world settings from like recidivism decisions in US courts, healthcare, um, self-driving cars, and so forth. However, when we look into experiences of people in these real world domains, we see that that perfect story of numbers going up do not necessarily translate to the experiences of people in the real world. The one on the left, I'm sure, how many of you have seen this gorilla example from Google? Around half. So when Google released their first image captioning, which was just giving a very short description for the images, these on the bottom middle part, you will see that these two African-American teenagers gave their picture to the system and the system recognized them as gorillas. On the right, we see these cases of self-driving cars causing harm for people. So what we are seeing case after case is that AI systems are not perfect. They are far from being perfect. They make mistakes. The kind of mistakes they make have different consequences for our society depending on the context and the use case they impact people's lives. So why this is happening? When we look into, I'm an AI researcher, I spend a lot of my time thinking about these kind of machine learning pipelines. When we look into these pipelines, we see that the current practice of developing machine learning systems is that people get their favorite data set, chomp it up into a training portion and a test portion, build their fabulous big many layered models in some cases from that training data, evaluate it in the same, in the test data that come from the same distribution as the training data. They look at these aggregate numbers like accuracy, they say we are doing great. However, there is a gap between this training pipeline and the experiences we have in the real world. Why? Walter talked about a few of them. Real world has a lot of outlier cases. Real world has a lot of complexity. And user expectations may not match the objective functions we are using in training our models. So we thought, how can we actually explore some of these problems? And can we use image captioning as a case study for doing that? So this is what we did um, two years ago with Mary Morris and our, with our intern. And we looked into image captioning. People have talked about image captioning. Machines look at a picture and try to generate a short one sentence description of what they see in the image. And there has been data sets like Coco that has been really like a big fool for the machine learning community to focus on this image captioning challenge. This became a celebrated, widely, um, widely used, widely studied problem in the machine learning community. And then this is, a this is a figure from one of the papers, 2016 paper from Microsoft, that actually compared the human captions with the blue sc on blue scores, the machine captions, and actually say that there is a large portion of the instances where the machine does so good, they actually do better than humans. And encouraged from these results, Microsoft released image captioning as a cognitive service that you can find today um, on the website. And developers are actually using these captioning services today. So we really wanted to understand how much value these existing online captioning services can provide for people. And to study this, we looked into captioning images that are shared on social media. Why social media? Because, first of all, Helping people with disabilities, visually blind people, has been the number one motivating example that all of these captioning people use you know, in their papers. When they are promoting the work on image captioning, they say, we are very excited that these technologies can be used to support visually impaired paper people in their daily lives. So we said, let's see. Let's see how much they are actually getting to this goal. 
And a good source of data and good platform to actually study this is social media because Ed's and Mary's work and others have shown that a lot of the content shared on social media, I think a billion a day or something like that, um, actually contains images and because these T tweets, for example, or other, con other content don't have alt text in them, visually impaired people cannot access this. And image captioning could be a great tool for them to understand what is go going on in, in social media. So that's what we wanted to focus on this domain. Um, and social media is really interesting. It is really giving you that real world context, real world use case. There is a lot of variety, different, different types of images, different conditions. People's expectations could be different in terms of how much level of detail they are expecting to get out of the captions. Or there's maybe they really want to understand the tweet so that they can decide to comment on it or retweet it, take actions on it, and the level of information they may need to be able to carry out those actions is not maybe what we are training our machine learning models to do. And also mistakes could be costly in these domains because if, like the Hillary Clinton example that was shown before, that showed before, if I look at that as a visually impaired person, I look at it and I really try, and I really create a meaning out of that. And I really believe in what I'm getting and I actually comment on it assuming that my understanding is correct. I can't really make a fool out of myself. I can't really take the wrong action and say the wrong thing. Um, and the research questions we studied in this work were how much value people are visually impaired people are getting from these services today? Can we develop hybrid intelligence approaches, approaches that combine machines and humans together um, to eliminate or overcome some of the reliability issues that automated systems have? And from the data we are getting from these human in the loop approaches, can we come to workflows that are more structured so that they can be generalizable across different um, use cases? And finally, can we drive generalizable lessons about how we should be developing reliable AI systems? So in this work, we looked into different kind of workflows, the first one being that just to use the machine, and then we incorporated more and more human feedback and help into the process. So when you look into this image, it is from Time Magazine and saying it's about the Egypt crash. When we give this image to the caption bot, it is saying that a man is sitting on a table. When we put human correction into it, this is the simplest human incorporation. I just give this caption to a human and ask the human to correct it. We are getting a bit better, but it still doesn't have the amount of detail that a human may need to be able to make sense of the tweet. Then we actually moved into more sophisticated support from the human where we paired a human being with the visually impaired human to have a conversation about the image and the caption bot's answer. So that conversation helps, but it doesn't really help much if the initial caption is wrong because the human can get into this such a bad understanding space that even a full support from a human cannot get them out of that misunderstanding space. And finally, we looked into some more structured workflows that are easier to scale. And we have an evaluation framework. You can see it in the paper. But we saw some very clear messages from this. First one, the amount of value humans got out of these captioning systems were very limited. And in some cases, the misunderstandings, the incorrect captions provided from these systems could get the people to such a bad place that regardless how much help they were having from humans and hybrid workflows, they couldn't get out of it. So it was very important to provide correct answers early on so that they don't get into that bad space. And any form of human in the loop contribution helped in any of these workflows. And we also validated these results with real um, visually impaired users back in the day. So how do we actually build better AI systems? That's kind of the question of the day. In my opinion, first of all, we need to acknowledge that the kind of the training flows people study, machine learning people study, is not how these systems are 
developed in reality, should function in the world reality, in, in reality, and how they should be evaluated. In fact, for many AI systems, AI systems are developed by people. The data is coming from people. People are putting objective functions, creating the experiences, thinking really carefully about how this machine learning model should be used in an existing application. Then there are a lot of human decisions that go into building the machine learning model. And we, we don't have to put the machine learning model without any human control. In many cases, some human in the loop approach, at least in the initial deployment phase, like a soft launch phase, can be actually very powerful to know, first to ensure that our systems are working reliably, but also to collect important feedback loops about how our system is functioning so that we can do good assessment and also continuous improvement for our systems. And finally, what matters for these systems is not these accuracy numbers or blue scores or mature scores that are celebrated in the communities, but it's actually the human value, how much value humans are getting out of it. So I just wanted to finish my part of the session with a few high level kind of lessons I got from this study and other studies I, I see. First of all, I think as a community, we should build not what is easy or available, but what is useful for our users. So we shouldn't be attracted to these existing data sets and aggregate metrics and just celebrate those numbers. We should really look into the real experience, the value that people get out of this. And to be able to do this, I think we should focus on this development pipeline for AI systems from design to data collection to model development to evaluation and ask the right questions. Why are we building this machine learning model or the integrative system? What value do we expect people to get out of this? What kind of an experience do we need to ensure reliability and value for people? What are the benefits and risks of the systems we are developing? And what kind of mitigation strategies we should develop into the system so that some negative consequences could be eliminated? Are we collecting the right data? Do we have the right objective function? And also, are we monitoring what these systems do in the real world? Second, we need to really build these virtuous feedback loops for the systems we are developing. For different use cases, we should collect data about human experiences. Um, you really use that feedback and maybe the human in the loop feedback to continuously improve our systems. So this is something that we have been focusing a lot in our, in our group in the last few years. Across many different data sets and machine learning models, we see that correct, perfect data sets never exist. It is always the case that our data sets are broken in some way, some important use case or a, work or a user group is excluded out. This is why in many cases we are seeing blind spots, biases in machine learning models. For example, when a certain group of users are not represented in the data set, it is not surprising that our models then show biases, show lower performance for some group of users. When we look into formulate this, it is actually very clear this is coming from blind spots in data sets. And in recent work that uh, Mary Morris is leading, um, we've been looking into different AI scenarios. This is just a thought experiment. Looking into different AI scenarios and trying to figure out what kind of biases may be hidden in existing AI systems for the disabled populations. If you, have, if you are deaf, if you are blind, um, if you have some certain disease, should we, should you, can you really expect satisfactory service from AI algorithms? Because it is very likely that our current data sets do not have sufficient representation from all of these groups. And also our techniques in the AI world may actually make the situation worse when we are doing outlier detection or our big models are actually not paying a lot of attention to small classes. And we are clearly seeing this with the VizViz data set where the kind of pictures that you see here are not, are not similar to the pictures that are in the training data sets that these models are trained for. So what do we do? Debugging. How do we do debugging troubleshooting for the AI world? Um, tomorrow, 
in the demo session, I, I'm gonna be demoing some tools that we are developing with our product groups in collaboration for error analysis and visualization. What we do in these tool sets is we get data, we get error labels, so we get these data sets that have success cases and failure cases, and we use interpretable machine learning techniques to separate the successes from the failures so that we can show developers interpretable explanations for where, for the regions where they are seeing disproportional errors. We really think that having these kind of tools that combine data science with visualization and interpretability is really important for developers to have to have access to human feedback in, in scalable ways and really figure out what are the next steps they should be taking for improving their models. And in 2017, Besmir Nushi um, and us have really focused on image captioning for troubleshooting and improvement for image captioning systems, where we show that we can do human in the loop debugging and troubleshooting to really identify what is the most important intervention and fix developers can do to improve these models and really get into that continuous feedback loop I talked about. And finally, um, my third lesson from this work is that we should be optimizing human value, not machine performance. Across many different applications where I'm seeing a lot of reliability and bias problems, I see that we are only doing automation. We are building the best machine learning model and putting them into the world, but that does not necessarily mean that machines are equipped to collaborate with people, to augment them in the right way. We really don't understand what it means to build partners. We really don't understand what it means to build AI systems that can collaborate with people, that can understand people that can explain themselves to people and so forth. So I, I think this is a very important area of work we should be focusing on in the AI community just to make sure that we are building machines not because we can build cool machines but because they can really help people. Um, so this all connects with the work we are doing in terms of building the engineering practices in AI age, especially at a place like Microsoft with a lot of AI products coming out to the market and these reliability and bias problems are real. We are thinking a lot about what are the tool sets, what are the best practices, guidelines, education material we should be providing to our engineers so that they can build reliable, trustworthy, responsible AI systems. Um, this is why we have an internal committee at Microsoft, if you haven't heard, called the Ether Committee. This stands for AI Ethics and Effects in Engineering and Research. This committee has a lot of um, contributions from the research community, but it's not limited to the research community. It has representation from product groups, our legal team, and together we are trying to address some of these hard problems. So if you're interested in this um, committee work and what we are doing in there, I'm happy to talk to you. So I'll stop here and together we can take questions. Thank you very much. So if we can have the panel, I'll, I'll sit up here. Okay. We can, everybody can be sort of the firing squad. That's right. So first uh, question, just back here. Hi, um, Margaret Burnett, Oregon State. Um, Itchy, I really loved your talk. Um, we're, we're sort of thinking along the same lines. Um, I did some work earlier on debugging um, the, the sort of what the human does once they get this feedback, and that's the part you skipped over. Could you just give us a, a nugget of, of how that part works after they've seen your, your visualizations and stuff, how they give feedback back? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm, I really hope that you stop by at the demo session tomorrow so that we can have a longer conversation about, about this. But the short answer is that there is no single intervention that is gonna work across different applications. In some cases, the developer may realize that, okay, this is a region that my models are not doing a good job, and I know because my data set doesn't have sufficient representation about these group of users, this group of users may correspond to racial or gender or age groups, it may relate to some sensitive attributes, and in that case, 
the developer and the team can go ahead and actually do focused data collection. And this is what happens here, at least, when the gender shades paper came out and um, showed problems with the face APIs. However, that, that may not be the solution in many cases. And one thing we've been thinking about is, let's say there is a very small and protected group, like some disability group. Can we really collect scalable data from them mm -hmm. to be able to really expand the data set significantly? That might not be a viable option. In those cases, we are looking into things like changing the objective function, really telling the model that this is an important group and they should try to get the numbers up as much as possible. But even having something like a model card that actually tells the users and the customers, these are the things I know I'm not doing very well, please do not rely on me. Mm -hmm. um, until I get that, you know, I'm, I'm acknowledging that I'm not very good at this is I think another step we should be doing a better job at. Okay, yeah, yeah let's see if we can sync up afterwards. That would be great, thank you very much. Other questions? Hi, I'm Save Savage. I'm from West Virginia University and also Microsoft Bing. Um, I don't know if you could uh, talk a little bit about the biases that exist um, in how crowds are labeling data. And I also had a question about um, whether you have experienced crowds uh, using the labeling as a sort of collective action. Uh, for instance, we saw in the image of Hillary uh, where maybe they were uh, labeling as a form of maybe resistance and, and, and opposition to, to the picture. Um, so I, I don't know if you can also share about those experiences. Thank you and great talks. Is it for me? Yeah. I'm I'm just taking things. It's a good question. Okay, I guess I'll can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I'll think out loud. I don't have a good canned response yet. It's a good question. Um, you cannot hear? Okay. One second. I'm just gonna hold it up to my I think it's can you hear me now? No? Okay. Okay. Okay, so biases. First off, I think the crowd, I'm gonna put out a disclaimer that I'm biased in thinking that the crowd does really good work. So I feel that often when people complain about the crowd, it's because the person who built the task doesn't build it in a specified way that allows for good work to result. Um, with that said, a lot of the tasks that I have recently posted have been very open-ended, which have revealed certain biases in terms of, so I'll give you a specific example. So uh, we put out a task to create a caption for an image. So given an image, describe in eight words or more what's in this image. And if you look at the way that, and we, we told the people who are describing the images, this is for people who are blind. So try to think about what would be useful to that population. And I show in my slide a picture of a green shirt with white writing on it. And the caption was very consistent across the people who provided it, which says a green shirt with white writing that says this. If you look at the question that the person who uh, submitted that image wanted to have an answer to, the question was, is this clean or dirty? And if you take a step at, back and you think what would be useful to a person that's blind, that seems pretty natural. That person doesn't want to know what's on the shirt necessarily, but wants to know is it clean or dirty. And there are so many examples like that. So I think the bias is understanding what is useful in the context. Um, so that's a significant bias I've seen. Yeah, I, I will just add a tiny bit to that to say it, it is interesting that you know, know your user population. Um, because we are finding in a completely different context that there are interesting beliefs and um, uh, not to say too much in detail, but you know, uh, beliefs in things like conspiracy theories uh, that differ depending on uh, what population you're going to. What? Can I give an answer also yeah, about a bias that I've seen in crowd workers? So there's um, a data set that a different group of, of researchers made uh, where it was uh, uh, language data set uh, that was meant for generating prediction for AAC devices, which are communication devices that people with speech disabilities might use, like think of Stephen Hawking, the kind of device he used. Um, and so to create that data set, uh, the researchers asked workers on Mechanical Turk 
to imagine that they were a person who was disabled and used a speech generating device and to compose some sentences about what they might want to say. Um, and if you actually look at that data set, I think that really shows the biases of the workers. So it's just full of really stereotyped uh, sentences like, make me some soup, I need a blanket, who will drive me to the doctor's office, which perhaps is representative of a small subset of what people with disabilities might want to talk about, but clearly doesn't encompass the variety that people would have in the real world. So I, I think there are actually quite a lot of examples of, of biases in using Turkers. Oh, I had a yeah. Is it, is, does it relate to this? Or? New question or? New question? One hand or two? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully it'll be a very simple answer to this question. Uh, so uh, this was prompted by Kathy's presentation, but I think it's relevant to everybody. So um, most of these talks, it's related to bias, but a little bit different. Oh, I'm Sean Kane from University of Colorado. Uh, so th this work on some level kind of assumes an objective reality that we can largely agree upon. Uh, and I'm wondering kind of how long can we coast on that? And are there places in these various projects where that's come up, so, and which is different fr maybe from a difference in perspective, or there, there's a little bit of, anyway. Uh, yeah, so how has this come up in your work? Right, well, actually, I like the, uh, is this shirt dirty? One can uh, imagine various interpretations. <laughs> like, how dirty? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know about the kind of postmodernist uh, uh, visual question answering uh, where we are on that progression just yet. Uh, certainly, if you, you can imagine asking just straight subjective questions uh, about, uh, there's the you know, work on fashion advice, right? It's um, highly subjective. I can give an answer. I'd probably be wrong. I'd probably be objectively wrong. But for most people, <laughs> that's a subjective question. Um, yeah, that's, I think, the extent that. You know, I think this is one of my worries with respect to limiting AI to automation rather than collaboration. When we look into AI algorithms being used to write paragraphs or pages or things like that, do we really want everybody to talk to us the same way and say the, say the same things? Um, because if AI algorithms are writing things, that's how things are gonna be. They are all gonna be conveying the same kind of ideas unless they are really trained to take that human idea, ideation phase into account and give the same sound and have the same style. That's why I'm more interested in AI technologies being used to actually support the human ingenuity instead of kind of take it away and just give a single voice to people. I think that's, that's very important. And I think that gets to the design stage more than the training stage. Well, but, but even at the training stage, so you know, one thing we're working on is uh, eliciting distributional answers. So you know you're not going to get one answer, so you just see what people say overall. And there are a couple of recent papers that show this is a more robust way to train machine learning systems as well. Um, don't tell it there's a single label. Tell it there's a distribution over the labels, um, which gets to that. Yeah, and so to add to that, so uh, we in our group did some work on trying to understand why do disagreements happen and coming up with the taxonomy of what are the sources and moreover we found that when we repurpose existing algorithms in the specific case it was for visual question answering when you take an existing state of art algorithm and you try to use it to predict why is there a disagreement you learn that those existing algorithms have learned to predict answers by understanding the nuance of why disagreement could arise and so if I think about where should we be going as a community, I think we need to have algorithms that have the crowd intelligence, can understand the pathways to different possible answers and understand when given, for example, an image or a visual question, there can be multiple options and figure out what is the right question to follow up with someone about saying, I have five plausible answers to a visual question, for example, here, you know, help me figure out which is the right one to give to you. So I think crowd intelligence is what we need to start thinking about when we think about building AI algorithms. Hi, I'm Jen Mankoff, University of Washington. Um, I was interested, all of you presented different pipelines for how we get from A to B essentially. Um, and at some level mentioned the presence of people with disabilities in those pipelines at the very 
minimum at the end, consuming what was produced, in some cases maybe generating a question. And I guess my question for you is, if you think about the entire pipeline, where are the places that you would ideally like, and let's assume at not, no capacity issue in terms of how many people are available, right? Where are the places you'd want to have people with disabilities in the pipeline? How would it change what happened? For example, maybe that question of crowd workers would have been phrased differently in the first place, or your structured question answering would be different in terms of um, getting the right data out of crowd workers, or I, I don't know, I'm just, you've been working on these pipelines. Where would you like to see more participation from people with disabilities, and what do you think would change? Uh, great question, and my argument is we want them at every single stage, and my argument comes from thinking about universal design and how a lot of innovation comes for thinking about populations that aren't traditionally considered. Uh, so an example that I like is the ramps that we have. Originally, it was built to pe help people with wheelchairs go up, but now people with suitcases can go up ramps, and you have many, you know, strollers, like mothers with kids, and so I would argue the same thing with when we're developing captioning systems, I believe there's going to be a lot of benefits to society at large. Um, my talk tried to talk about the benefits of just thinking about the images taken by people who are blind, so thinking about data collection, not as much on algorithm generation yet. Um, and I hopefully convince people in the audience that there's a lot of interesting problems that go beyond people who are blind, such as low quality images, which would happen, for example, if you have a robot taking images or privacy information, I'm pretty sure as people grow, you know, anyone needs help interpreting medical information, right? Um, and then just being able to analyze text to get there. So my argument is every stage, and hopefully I convinced you all that data collection is a part of that that's important. So I have to agree with, with that. You, you definitely want it at every stage. One of the interesting things that um, we, uh, sort of naively did with our um, original site system was that we wanted to have, uh, this was when we were doing bar charts, but it was a question answering, you know, all right, we're giving you a high level message. What other questions would you like to ask? And the blind people, people who were blind said, how do we know? <laughs> We've never seen, we have no idea how you use these. We have no idea because we've never interacted with them. So there is a, there's, there's a like kind of funny play there. Um, and that's why in part of what we did with our system was to try and figure out how are people that are cited actually using these? What is it about these visualizations that people are pulling out? And then can we figure out how to package that? So it's, you definitely want to know, is that going to be helpful? But you have to be careful that you're asking the right question, a question that makes sense for, for them. All right, we got room, we got time for maybe one, two more. We're over time a little bit right now. So we're eating into your coffee break, just know that. Uh, so we got one, we got two questions here. So let's, let's do those two questions and hopefully we can. Oh, uh, I just want to make a comment. Uh, so first of all, um, my name is Gang Luo from uh, Escape and Sciary Research Institute at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Donna mentioned about uh, uh, 38 million uh, visually, impaired, visually, uh, visually impaired people. Uh, just what I just want to point out. Out of those 38 million people, uh, this, uh, it's a very wide spectrum of uh, vision impairment. Not all of them are completely blind. Uh, some have a central vision loss. They have a very low view acuity. Some have a view field loss. They have a good view acuity, but they lost view field. So because of this, their needs are going to be very different. So here, all of the uh, speakers talking about we have to have a human in the loop. So. Uh, because they have different needs. So I, I think that if you try to uh, come up with a caption, uh, one fits all caption, you, you're gonna, uh, you cannot avoid failures. Uh, so I think it's very important uh, thing is uh, uh, to have a human in the loop is to have the users to initiate the need, their question. And we'll give a number of uh, examples uh, what people may ask. I think all of them can be uh, considered as a visual search. 
So the different people have different needs. Uh, so if the, the AI uh, can first understand the needs of the users and then try to interpret the image, I think that may be a good way uh, to go. This is my opinion. Uh, so yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. No, no and I, I completely agree. I mean, I think the idea that we've started at kind of one extreme, we're assuming in a lot of this work that it's uh, a uh, either completely blind or, or nearly completely blind end user in these applications um, uh, does limit that design space, right? So if we had an end user who could contribute in a slightly different way, maybe has a different set of questions because they can make out you know, ba object boundaries, right? And so that they can direct their question in a different way, we will get very different um, uh, data sets out of this, for example. Uh, and there are different potential solutions. Um, the other thing that's interesting that didn't come up, I think, in a lot of these uh, talks is that you can leverage the end user's understanding of the broader context even in the case that they are totally blind, right? So I think the, the Vizwiz example, there are always these cases where you can catch the, the wrong answer um, even though you don't directly have any visual information because you asked, what is the oven set to? Uh, one person said uh, 400, one person said 450, and one person said uh, it's a white oven, <laughs> right? Like that didn't help. Um, or they said, egg timer, it's something that is obvious to pick out. And in VizWiz, that was just left up to the end user uh, interpretation, right? But you could imagine actually building the system in a way that uses the, the person's context for wh why they're asking the question, how the, where they're asking the question, what they already know about what a plausible set of answers are, things like that, to narrow it down without having to go out to a crowd to get an independent set of labels. labels. So, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to jump on that one too. Um, I really appreciate your comment, and I think that the nuances go beyond just uh, what are the wants of people in terms of information, but also the mechanism for delivering the information. So, for example, people who are uh, blind, who are literate, and using technology can actually hear at speeds much faster than I can. Uh, and so to provide content at the way I'm speaking now would be very irritating in technology. And so I do agree with you that having some understanding of the context of who is the person matters a lot. Um, and just to make it in more abstract terms, I think what we're talking about literacy. So what is, for example, someone's visual literacy? Um, for example, if someone goes blind later in life, they might have more spatial understanding than someone who's born blind. Um, and someone that has a little bit of vision might have access to some, they might have a bit more literacy. And so thank you for the comment and I couldn't agree more. We should probably wrap up there. We're already five minutes over. So um, let's give our, our speakers a fabulous round of applause and thank you all.